one. Jack is on his way to Margaret's house party. He is phoning her for directions. First, you will have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Jack has got lost on his way to Margaret's party. He is phoning her for directions. Hello, is that Margaret? Yes, who's speaking? Margaret, it's Jack. I think I'm lost. I can't see a signpost and... Jack, so where are you now? Well, I'm a bit confused about the directions, but I'm at a T-junction. What can you see around you? I can see a pub on the corner. Can you see the name of the pub? Wait a minute. Let me see. It's hard to see in the dark. Yes, I can read it now. It's called the Lion's mm, Head. Oh, the Lion's Head. OK, well, then you're not too far away. Go straight ahead through the traffic lights to the next T-junction. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? I said, just go through to the next T-junction. OK. Now what? Well, there's a park in front of you and a large two-storey building on the corner. Ah, uh, yes, I can see them. OK. So now turn left. Hang on. You're coming up the street, so you'll have to turn right. OK, got it. What's the name of your street? It's Wesley Street. W-E-S-L-E-Y, number 70. Where the fifth house on the left, you should see a red letterbox and some bushes in front of the house. OK. Fifth house, number 70. I should be there soon. Am I late for the party? It sounds like things are happening there. No, it's only just started. That's good. I should be there in the next ten minutes. See you soon. Jack hangs up and walks on. Seven minutes later, he calls Margaret again, as he still can't find the house. You now have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. As you listen, answer questions 6 to 10. speaking. Hi Margaret, it's Jack again. Sorry to bother you. Listen, would you mind doing me a favour? Of course, what? Could you tell Mike I have got his camera? I've tried to send him a text message but it's not going through. Oh, he's not here yet. Oh dear, he said he'd be there early. He might be lost too. Okay, I'll call him. What's his number? 0482 Oh, so that's 0485 no, no, 0482-563379. OK, I'll call him right away. But where are you now? Well, I'm in your street, but I still can't find your house. I can't see the numbers very clearly, or a red letter box. It's pretty dark. I thought you said it was easy to find. Oh, OK, wait there. I'll come outside and get you. All right, then. And don't worry about calling Mike. I'll try to call him now. Hang on, there's someone coming down the street. It looks like Mike. Oh, and I can see the letterbox now. It was hidden behind a bush. See you soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk given by Madeline. She is going to introduce the recreational facilities on campus and in town. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20.
As you listen to the talk, answer questions 11 to 20. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Madeline Stewart, and I'm here to tell you about the recreational facilities available on campus, and also to tell you something about what the town has to offer. You may already know that your student's union membership also includes membership of the sports union, which provides a range of sporting and recreational facilities on campus, much the same as those in most British universities. The sports union has football, tennis, and cricket teams in local competitions. And really, most sports are catered for in some way on campus, even if they're just social matches. In the building itself, there are fitness classes and a full gym, including weights. The sports union can also provide cheap tickets to some major sporting events. And to keep you up to date with everything available, there's a weekly newsletter distributed around the campus. You should check this to find out the names and phone numbers of the contact people for each sport or activity you are interested in. Er, yes, did you have a question? Yes, uh, apart from what you've just said, does the sports union offer individual help in any of its activities, uh, for example, in getting fit and healthy? Yes, we do. The sports union has a fitness assessment clinic every Friday, staffed by the resident sports trainer, who can provide advice on the best program for you and refer you to various charts. I'm sure you all realize that for any medical assessment or health problem, you should go to the university medical service. The sports trainer can also advise you on a suitable training program using the weights. And now on to Ashbury. For a town of its size, Ashbury has some unusually good leisure and sporting facilities, most of which are near the center of town and easily reached by bus from this campus. There's a new, well, almost new, Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's not quite in the central town area, but it's only a five-minute walk from the bus stop. Above the pool, there's a high-tech fitness center that any of you more serious fitness lovers would need to check out. Then, in the center of town, there's a sporting complex called the Anderson Center, which contains squash courts and facilities for a number of other indoor sports, such as basketball. And just around the corner from the Anderson Center, in the main street there, is an indoor bowling alley. All of these facilities are listed in the weekly newsletter so I encourage you all to look through it and... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. hear a conversation between a research student, Jeremy, and his supervisor. They are talking about the process of having a research project published in a journal. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, you're nearly ready to submit your article to an academic journal, are you? Yes, I think so. I just wanted to go over all the things I need to do before I submit it. And then, I wanted to go over the submission process with you. Great. So, firstly, you need to write an abstract. Make sure it's short and concise. Of course. I forgot all about that. And what about key words? <laughs> yes. A lot of students overlook this part and just jot down whatever comes to mind. But take some time to make a list of key words that are accurate and relevant. Okay. Another thing. Could you have a look at my article before I submit it? Absolutely. 
Actually, at least two senior staff members should always read through a final draft before submission. Do you mind if I give it to Professor Johnson to have a look at as well? Not at all. I'd be glad to have the feedback. Do you know which journal you want to submit to yet? Not yet. I have a short list of about three that I'm interested in. Make that decision soon, because you'll need to adjust your article so that it matches the style guide of the journal you are submitting to. I bet that can take a while. Yes, but after that, you are just about ready to submit. One more thing, you'll have to sign the copyright form, just confirming that it's your own work, and then you're good to go. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, the submission process. How does it work exactly? Well, the first thing is to just send it off. You've got to send in the manuscript before anything else can happen. Sure. And then should I call to check if they have received it? No need for that, no. All you have to do is just log on to your email regularly because you will get a submission confirmation once they have processed the manuscript. And that will have comments on what they thought of it? No, no comments yet. That email is just to let you know they have received it. The next stage is what is known as peer review. This is when experts in the field review your manuscript and decide whether to accept it. Ah, they'll never accept me. I'm only a master's student. Don't worry about that, Jeremy. It's all done through a double-blind method. That means that whoever reads your manuscript has no idea whether you are a grad student or a Nobel Prize laureate. They'll only be judging your work, not you. Well, that's good to hear. And then what? once they've made their decision? Well, there are four possible outcomes. You might get an acceptance, but a first-off acceptance is very, very rare. Don't pin your hopes on it. You could also get a rejection, but these don't happen very often either. I don't think this will be a problem. What do you think I'll get? <laughs> if you're very lucky, you'll get a conditional acceptance. This means that they've accepted the article and it will be published, but you need to tweak a few things first. A sentence here, a heading there, nothing major. That sounds good. But to be honest, you will probably end up with a revise and resubmit. This means they are definitely interested, but you will need to rework the paper before it's accepted. The necessary changes will be outlined by the reviewers. Okay. So I just fix the things that need changing and present it again? Yes, but include a cover letter that discusses the changes you have made. The same goes for a conditional acceptance, actually. It helps the reviewers see that you've taken their criticism seriously. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about sport in Ireland. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Now today we're going to be finding out about the most popular sports in the Emerald Isle. That's Ireland, of course. Can you guess what they are? Well, there are these two lesser played games, a form of rounders and Gaelic handball. But we'll start with one which is perhaps over 3,000 years old, arriving in Ireland with the Celts, some claim. That may be a slight exaggeration, but I consider it to be the fastest field game in the world, and it goes by the name of hurling. Well, that's what it's known as in the English-speaking world anyway. So, what do you have to do? You've got 15 players on a team, one of them the goalkeeper. Each one has a stick called a hurley. Here you are. I've brought mine along. Had it since I was at school. This is what it looks like, and basically you have to get this ball, called a schlitter, that's S-L-I-O-T-A-R, so it's not spelt the way it's pronounced. You hit it into the net for three points, or you can hit it over the net for one point. The goal looks like the letter H, with the net under the crossbar. The goalie has a bigger stick than the others to help keep the ball out. You can also catch the schlitter and run with it for four steps maximum, or bounce it on your stick. Is that clear to you all? I'll be showing you a video a bit later, so you can see what a game actually looks like. You might like to think of it as a mixture of lacrosse, hockey and baseball. Oh, and it's played by women too, but it goes by the name of camogie in that case. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. I'll give you a bit of the history, shall I now? Generally, the golden age of the game is considered to be the 18th century, but systematic rules were first agreed and drawn up at that great shrine of learning, Trinity College Dublin, in 1879, founding the Irish Hurling Union closely followed just a few years later by the formation of the Gaelic Athletics Association. With greater organisation last century, the All-Ireland Hurling Championship got off to a flying start, and I'm proud to say that my own native city of Cork has won more than 20 titles over the years. But then, so have Kilkenny and Tipperary. Is it only played in Ireland? No. Well, it is the only country with a national team at the moment, but you may be surprised to discover there are hurling clubs in London, as well as in America and Argentina, to name just a few. The other game I'd like to take a little time to introduce you to is Gaelic football, which is played on the same pitch as hurling with the same number of players, but there's no net. You just have to get the ball over your opponent's goalposts. And you can do that by kicking or punching the ball. However, you're not supposed to do that to the players, I might add. Imagine it as a combination of soccer and basketball. But in my opinion, it's a more exciting spectacle than either of those. Excuse my bias, if you will. It's also very popular with women. In fact, there are more women's teams than for any other sport whether despite or because of the physical contact involved, I wouldn't like to say. They do play a shorter game, 60 minutes, rather than the men's 70. So, let's have a look. If we can have the lights down, I'll see if I can get this technology to work. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.